how do you define that maladaptive transformation from yeah. uh, normal anxiety, which I, I suppose you could even make the case if a person was incapable of experiencing anxiety, they could probably injure themselves and they might be socially quite destructive. So in other words, there must be some evolutionary basis for anxiety and self-preservation. Yes. Uh, but yes. as you point out, uh, I can't imagine anybody listening to this hasn't been personally experienced uh, or hasn't personally experienced or known somebody who has experienced anxiety that has crossed too far. But but it, I mean, is this something that falls into the DSM-5 where there's an actual criteria? I mean, there must be, right? Yes. Yeah, th there are. And and in fact, it's the, it's the, the criterion uh, to, for rising to the level of disorder in, in, the, in the psychiatric uh, uh, literature and in the DSM-5 or, or a diagnostic and statistical manual is that it's only a disorder if there's impairment in what we call social or occupational functioning. So you could have any symptom in psychiatry, even a hallucination, for example. But if it's not impairing your life, your social or occupational function, we don't call it a disorder. And in fact, I've had patients who, who, were, who were hallucinating, but it was in a way that was not disrupting their life. I had a blind patient who had visual hallucinations, but he was, he was fine with them. They weren't uh, distressing to him. And so we wouldn't say it's a disorder. Mm -hmm. It's just something happening. So that's the criterion we use, and of course, it it uh, is somewhat uh, you know flexible because different people have different social and occupational situations, and and this is a challenge we have in psychiatry. But maintaining that as a criterion is is very good because it ensures that we only treat things that that need to be treated. So that then you think about anxiety. Well, if you can't function, if you can't leave your apartment. Uh, to go to work, well, that's impairing your your occupational functioning, and so that that there are people who have anxiety easily in that realm or far beyond, and those are people we we want to help. On the flip side, as as you point out, there are people who have risk taking behavior that's extreme because they don't perceive or or worry about threat, and and that's also a problem. So anxiety, we we need to 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 treat it in patients who are severely affected. And the problem is, in anxiety, there are uh, medications that help, but they come with uh, some problems. So the most effective anti-anxiety medications are things that relate to you know, uh, Valium and Xanax and, and Ativan. As you know, these are medications that work. Uh, but they can be addictive. They can uh, cause the human being to adapt to the dose and to, to make it very difficult to stop them. Um, and and these, do these cause... work, do, do we think that they primarily work through their GABA agonism? Is that the yes, primary right. belief? Yeah. So they, they you, you talked about GABA earlier. This is a relaxing, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, neuro, neurotransmitter. This is a non-excitatory. That's right. That's right. And that's exactly how these act. They, they act, in fact, directly on the GABA uh, uh, receptor and they facilitate its its action and so this is um, but they they work they're just they just have some some problems and not everybody can tolerate them they cause some cognitive slowing and sedation and and so on it's like they have some issues and which neurons in particular do we think that they're concentrated in their action in that is a great question it's su subject of a lot of research if we understood that deeply then we could make a separate intervention targeted to those cells. The problem is that we don't yet know that exactly. We don't know exactly which cells are the most anxiety relevant cells that these, these medications are, are targeting. Um, there are some, some hints, but I would say not factually known yet. So, but, but you're getting to this key point where optogenetics was helpful because then we could ask that and answer that question. We could say, okay, which cells govern the different uh, features of anxiety. And then, uh, what am I talking about here with different features? Well, actually, this is kind of interesting when you think about it. So what is anxiety? Well, it's actually got different parts to it. First of all, there's physiology. We've all been anxious. We know heart beating faster, breathing faster. Okay, so there's physiology that changes. Then, there's also a behavioral change. We, When we're anxious, we avoid the risky situation. We have an impulse to to avoid if we're <laughs> if we're anxious out in the open. We avoid going out in the open, and mice do that. Do this too. 
And then finally, there's a negative quality to it, which this is the, this trivial. is the negative valence. This is the hardest this part the to put valence. your finger on. This is the hardest part to put your finger on, and it's the most mysterious and perhaps the most difficult. But meaning the perhaps most the most difficult to experience. It's the most difficult to experience, and it's also the most difficult to understand why we have this. If if we're already avoiding the risky situation, why does nature also have to make us feel bad? Mm -hmm. And and this is there are some very interesting evolutionary uh, uh, discussions one can have about that. The fact is, though, that's that's how it is. Anxiety feels bad, and that's what makes it. Uh, in many cases, so so clinically uh, uh, causes so much suffering in addition to the behavioral dysfunction that happens. So actually, anxiety is complicated. It's got these different parts, and they all come on together and all go away together. And then you've got to ask, okay, these these are so different, they're probably controlled by different cells, right? So you've got behavior, and you've got breathing, and you've got inner subjective sense. These are all very different. Probably different cells are doing it. So then right away, you've got to ask, what are we going to target? And so we, we thought we, we need to figure out this. And so we used, in 2013, we did a, an optogenetics experiment that targeted uh, different uh, parts of what we thought could be the anxiety pathway. And we found that, indeed, different cells control each of these different parts. There's a set of cells that control the breathing changes. And there's another set of cells right nearby that control the behavioral changes, avoiding risky situations. And there's yet a third set of cells that control the negative valence, the internal state. Each cleanly controls a separate feature of anxiety. And we did this with optogenetics, e introducing light sensitivity. And then reproducing each of these completely distinct manifestations of anxiety. Exactly, exactly. So you, we, could, we found we could turn up or down each feature in mice completely separately from the others. We could have animals that, and this, this got so interesting philosophically, we could make animals uh, avoid the open area, the exposed realm that, that people and mice, but we don't, many people don't like being out in exposed areas. Mice definitely don't because that's when they, they're going to get eaten. Uh, we could make mice in, be much more uh, avoidant of an open space with a specific cell type optogenetic intervention, but the mice didn't care that this was happening. There was no negative valence to it. <laughs> and this was so interesting that, that you, we could create the behavioral avoidance of anxiety without the mice... Without the negative feeling. Having this negativity, and so that and, and it turns out then that that behavioral states that, that that mammals have, they can be cleanly broken apart into these features, and we could show that with optogenetics. This podcast is for general informational purposes only, and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.